You're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine that's broadcast in English and Persian via New Channel TV. Hi everyone, I'm Mayam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Borspuya. In this week's program, we interview Kenan Malik on European migration crisis and profiling. We'll also be talking about International Women's Day, the Iranian Majlis or Assembly, and what you know some of the parliamentarians think about women and the place itself. We'll also be discussing the draft law in Egypt to ban the niqab in public places, a, a topless act against the veil, as well as an insane fatwa on LGBT advocacy work. Don't go away. This week that passed, we saw the celebration of International Women's Day. It's a day that historically marked the 1908 working women's strike. Thousands of women, textile women workers, came onto the streets in New York City. And a few years later, at an international socialist gathering, Clara Zetkin asked and called for this day to be an international day. And that's exactly what it is, a day to celebrate resistance. Yes, absolutely. Always reminding that, you know, there is um, oppression, uh, that actually nowadays being women, it's a crime in many societies and in many countries. But that resistance element is important. That's what is, makes it international movements and solidarity with resistance. But we'll see that, you know, in a stock exchange in New York, you know, they ring the bell to start trading, that's all women are there. Uh, they see that as a sign of progress, possibly. Or Erdogan's um, uh, wife, mm. Emine Erdogan, she's sort of uh, defending harem of the uh, um, Turkish sultans. sultans yeah, yeah, yeah. R ridiculous. Uh, I even saw a tweet by Ayatollah Khamenei, who said that the basis of Western culture is that women are presented as products, objects that benefit men. And I'd like to remind him of signs in Iran which um, compare unveiled women to unwrap sweets. If anything, you know, uh, it's sort of uh, Islamic culture, the Islamic regime's culture is one that also sells women as commodities and commodifies them, sexualizes them from a really young age. He is the last person to be speaking and on actually, International we, Women's Day. We know where the roots <laughs> and sources of all this misogynist policy and billboards in Iran come from. It's right from him and his cronies and his friends. Yeah, definitely. Uh, now, uh, it's interesting because, you know, there was the elections in Iran. We've been talking about them for a while. But it's really funny because one of the conservative MPs that were elected, his name is uh, Nader Ghazipur. There's a film of him saying that uh, the Islamic Assembly is not the place for donkeys or women. <laughs> and, and this shows really the level of uh, his respect uh, for women and all that election in, in Iran. This is, you know, to some extent, you know, the whole place is rotten, really, to the oh, core. Rotten. It's rotten, rotten to the core, really, the <laughs> well, uh, Iranian sort of uh, majlis. is not a place that actually people should go. This no. is... The other sort of um, one of old representatives said, this is a mosque for us. It's she a said it's like a mosque. We go and do ablutions first and then we pray and then we go and legislate misogyny. But what's funny is that seriously, if there were donkeys in the Islamic Assembly, they would most probably have better laws. There, at least there would be good law in support of animal rights in Iran. Yeah, so, you know, we wish there were more donkeys and less of these so-called parliamentarians. Now, of course, the journalists that... Um, put this uh, video of the MP saying that women and donkeys shouldn't be in parliament. He was beaten up for, for doing that. So, you know, it just goes to show, you know, where the justice lies in this uh, system. Now, following on that, we know that there's legislation now in Egypt calling for uh, the ban of the niqab in public places and government institutions. And already in Egypt, there's a ban for doctors and nurses in medical hospitals and 
uh, training centers as well as um, in univer academic uh, settings. So this will be though for public places and government offices. And I think th th this is the right thing to do. And I think there is a lot of appetite in uh, Middle East and North Africa within the general population to ban signs of the Islamist really yeah. reaction. And uh, you know this creates an environment for people to uh, be um, resisting against yeah. Islamists. I mean, these, these are important things. I mean, in the, last, in the previous program, we referred to the attempt in, ba in Bangladesh to separate um, um, Islam, sorry, from, the Islam state from, from, from a state religion. And yeah. these are uh, very welcomed uh, moves in, and these are a sign of the resistance that exists. Yeah, and the Al-Azhar, um, you know, scholar who basically defended this ban, he said that, well, it's a Jewish, uh, you know, um, thing. It's not really, you're not really needing to wear a niqab if you're Muslim. And it's like, you know, everything is a Jewish conspiracy. Well, the underlying <laughs> anti-Semitism here. Meanwhile, yeah. in Israel, people just walking around with <laughs> any niqab. And he, this guy is saying, is, is a Jewish sign anyhow. So you don't need niqab. I mean, that's anti-Semitism right through. Egyptian Islamists. But it does Egyptian. show that, you know, the niqab is something that is highly contested, whilst, of course, you have lots of do-gooders here in the West saying that it's people's right to religion. You can see that it is something that is challenged and contested. And many, many, many places see it as a, a banner of the Islamist movement and not something that is uh, linked to devotion or religion per se. Last week, I interviewed the wonderful author Keenan Malik on the immigration crisis profiling. It's a very long interview, it's, the, it's around 30 minutes, but we thought we'll show you the entire video because of the important issues that it addresses. You really don't want to miss this interview. Stay with us. Hi, Keenan Malik. Welcome Hi. to our program. Well, it's nice to be back. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask you first and foremost about this you know, unprecedented migrant crisis that we're facing. What are the root causes of it? Well, the first thing I think is that we call it a migration crisis, but it's as much a crisis of the response as it is about migration. It's the EU's response to migration that has created so many deaths, for instance, that created all the um, scenes in the Balkans where, where, where people are piling up in the Balkans, that, that is creating a, a possible humanitarian crisis in Greece. There was a, a, um, a, a journalist from uh, Der Spiegel magazine, journalist Der Spiegel magazine, who, who visited Frontex, which is the um, European uh, Frontiers Agency uh, responsible for, for um, uh, keeping the borders safe, as it were. And he made the point that the language being used there was that of Europe at war. And I think that's part of the problem, is that we see the, the, the migration crisis as a, as a kind of war between Europe and the migrants. Um, the roots of it are quite deep in the, in the sense that it, ha it hasn't simply just happened. You know, the people have been dying trying to get into Europe for 25 years and more. And you can trace the roots of the, of, of the current crisis back to the early 1990s. Um, at that time, Spain had an open border with North Africa. And it worked very well. Um, North African workers used to come to Spain largely to do seasonal work. And when there was no work, they'd go back and, and there was no problem with it. But in 1986, Spain had joined um, the EU. And as part of the deal with the EU, Spain had to close its borders. So it created a, a closed border with North Africa. It didn't stop migrants coming in. They just took to boats. Um, and it's the first time, in fact, that people started taking to boats to... To, to smuggle themselves in, into Europe. And I think it was May 1991, the first bodies were washed ashore. Um, and since then, there have been something like 20,000 deaths in the, in, 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 in the Mediterranean alone, people of uh, migrants trying to come to Europe. But what the Spanish approach did was that it provided a template for subsequent EU policy towards migrants. Um, there was a uh, EU policy is based on three things. There's a kind of three-pronged attack, if you like. 
The first is to criminalise migrants and treat them as criminals. The second is to militarise border control. So, for instance, NATO is now involved in the Aegean in, 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 to, to look for uh, smugglers' boats. And the third thing is to uh, outsource immigration controls, uh, largely to, to countries of North Africa or of a place like Turkey. Um, so back in uh, the, the uh, 1990s, um, the EU paid a huge sum of money to Colonel Gaddafi so that his security forces effectively became Europe's border police. Um, now they're paying three billion pound uh, euros to Turkey um, to ensure that Turkey keeps uh, refugees that come from larger from Syria and that they don't enter Europe. So effectively, it's outsourcing uh, border controls and, and and relocating Europe's borders outside of Europe. And those three approaches, which began with uh, the, the Spanish experience, have now become central to uh, the European. Um, way of dealing, the EU's way of dealing with migration. But some will say, well, n no, you know, it's impossible to allow everyone in. What would your response be to that? Well, there, there, there are, there certainly, there, there are much larger numbers coming in um, than there used to be, um, uh, largely because there's now a, an arc of conflict, if you like, from Afghanistan to Nigeria, caused by the rise of Islamism, of the Islamic State in particular, of Western intervention, a whole host of different reasons where, for why civil authority has collapsed in many of those areas and it has uh, created uh, wars, uh, conflicts, and so there are much larger numbers coming in. But we should, not be, we should not overstate the numbers. A million came last year. Uh, that's about 0. or just over 0.1% of the EU's population. In Lebanon, 20% of the population are uh, uh, refugees. Turkey, with which uh, the EU has, has done a deal, so Turkey um, uh, uh, it effectively keeps all the, all, all the Syrian refugees in Turkey. Turkey has over 2 million uh, uh, refugees already. Pakistan has over a million. Iran has over a million. In other words, the poorest, some of the poorest countries in the world already host much, much larger numbers um, than uh, we have in Europe. Uh, if the, the number of refugees in Lebanon, if the same proportion were in Europe, would there be 180 million refugees in Europe? So that, you know, while the numbers are large, we should be wary of, of overstating them. If places, countries like Turkey or um, Pakistan or the Lebanon or Jordan were to take the same, same position, the same stance as the EU does, then we really would have a migrant crisis. Um, and part of the EU's policy, it seems to me, is to try and get the poor, some of the poorest countries in the world to take on the task of, 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 of dealing with the refugee crisis. And that is, in, that is immoral, in my view. What do you say to people who are what do you say to those who say a majority that are coming are economic migrants, not refugees, and therefore shouldn't be allowed in? I think the distinction between refugees and economic migrants um, is often a false one. If you're, you might be fleeing from war and conflict and persecution, you might be fleeing from poverty. It's not as if that you can make an easy distinction between the two and say one person should have uh, the, the right to come to Europe, the other person shouldn't. Um, those who flee from, from um, persecution or from war or conflict are also looking for jobs, are also uh, economic migrants in that sense. So we shouldn't um, overplay that distinction. How about the, you know, people saying that it's fine to have Christians, for example, come to Europe, but given that a large majority of uh, those fleeing are now Muslims, it is going to change the character of Europe and the West. Well, migration always changes the character of, of, of any country, but then so do lots of other things. Um, you know, had not a single migrant come to Europe in the past 50 years, Europe would still be a very different place now than it was 50 years ago. So we imagine that mi it's migration that creates all the changes we see migration does. But there are lots of other things from uh, uh, over the past 50 years um, that created those 
social changes. So again, we should not overstate uh, the changes that um, uh, migration brings about. But there's, a, there's another argument really underlying this, this idea that Christians should come in, but Muslims shouldn't. It is that Europe is a Christian continent that has certain values and that Muslims don't hold those values. I think it's a wrong way of looking at how, what values are and how societies or communities have values. In any society, in any community, values are contested. There is no society, no uh, uh, community where there is a single set of values. And that's as true of Europe as it is tr uh, as of Muslim communities. Um, a, a supporter of the Front National um, or of Pegida, the, 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 the anti-Muslim group, would have a very different notion of what constitutes European values than, say, you and I would, um, or what should constitute European values than you and I would. Um, similarly, if, if you take Muslim communities, Muslim communities are as diverse um, and as, uh, 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 are as uh, conflicted in, in, in the values they hold as, as any other communities. Why are so many refugees coming to Europe? Because there are conflicts, bitter conflicts, in places like Syria. I.e. there's a contestation of values as the, the kind of country uh, people want Syria to be. Uh, what people call the Arab Spring, the, the uprisings of, of um, uh, people against authoritarian, um, sometimes Islamist leaders um, in the Arab world. That was a contestation of values. Um, and it's worth remembering that in that case, uh, in many countries like Saudi Arabia or Bahrain, um, the rulers were only able to reimpose control because of support from Western governments. So this, this idea, this, this is fundamental distinction between the values of Europe or the values of the West and the values of uh, refugees coming from Muslim majority countries is simply not true. There's a contestation of values. And it seems to me those who argue for allowing Christians in but not uh, Muslims are actually um, very illiberal, and therefore very un-European in, 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 in the values that they're expressing. What about those who say, well, other refugee waves were different, they were better, you know, this wave is, is, is not the same? It's historical amnesia. They should go back and, and look at how different refugees or groups of migrants were treated. If you go back to the beginning of the last century, when there was a large, um, not a large, it was a small influx of Jewish uh, migrants into Europe, Western Europe, fleeing from pogroms in the East, um, there was uproar in, uh, in, 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 in um, uh, in, in Western Europe about Jews coming in. Uh, Britain's first Immigration Act, the 1906 Aliens Act, was designed specifically to keep Jews out of Britain. Uh, people were talking about Jews as undermining British culture, as undermining British values. There was a debate in Parliament um, where one MP um, used quite an extraordinary uh, metaphor. He said, you know, if you have a, a loaf of bread and you have a small grain of arsenic in it, that's fine. But if you have too many grains of arsenic, then you kill yourself. And that's the metaphor he was using for, for, for Jewish refugees coming to Britain. Um, similarly, when Catholics, we forget how um, hated Catholics were, Catholics to, uh, to America, there was a huge uproar about Catholic immigration to America. Um, Catholics were seen actually in much the same way as Muslims are now that their uh, principal loyalty wouldn't be to America, it would be to the Vatican, that they had a set of values distinct from those of American values. And then you had um, the post-war uh, uh, migration from um, the old colonies, European colonies, from uh, South Asia, from the Caribbean, from African countries. And, and the same arguments about uh, being swamped, if you remember Margaret Thatcher's phrase, the, the, the Britain uh, would not want to be swamped by people of a different culture. Um, this was said in, you know, in the 1970s about um, Asian and Caribbean migrants. So um, the same kinds of arguments that these people are, have different values from us, they have a different culture from us, uh, they won't fit in, they're criminals, 
uh, they've been made uh, again and again and again with every wave of migration over the past century. What do you say to those who are concerned about security and saying that letting migrants in is letting the jihadis and the Islamists in and that Muslims should be profiled? It's a security risk having them that's different from previous migration waves. Again, people used to make the same argument about security risk actually in, in, in previous um, uh, waves of migration. But the point is that it may be that within a group of refugees, there are some who are Islamists, maybe there's some who are jihadists. Um, you, you, you may want to weed out the jihadists if you know them to be jihadists. Um, there's no reason why um, you wouldn't want to weed them out, no jihadists. Um, but the point is that, that um, unless you say no one can come into Europe or no one can come into America, the kind of Trump argument, then it'll inevitably be the case that, that, that there may be some who come in who are jihadists. There are certainly some who come in who may be criminals, who may be rapists, uh, who may be uh, reactionary. Um, any random group of people in the world will have people who have reactionary views, who, have, uh, uh, who engage in criminal activities and so on. Um, refugees are no different. Migrants are no different. Um, they're not saints. Uh, they're like any other random group of people in the world. So unless you say no refugees and no migrants into Europe, you have to accept that that may be the case. But why should people accept that? I mean, this is Pegida's argument, for example, even if it means a few are rapists and uh, jihadists, isn't it better to close the borders than to let people in and risk that? Well, unless you, you're going to say no migrants at all, um, which is a, a, a completely implausible position to have, then you have to take that risk. What's the effect of the rise of groups like Pegida, even like uh, someone like Donald Trump, on you know, society at large? Well, I think you have to understand why um, Trump has such great uh, resonance in cert among certain sections of uh, the US population, why populist groups from Pegida to the Front National to UKIP are growing in Europe. Um, I think it would be wrong to simply dismiss it as the rise of racism. I, th I, it, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a deeper issue than that. And the deeper issue is the transformation in the political landscape. And if you go back to the post-war Europe, the political landscape was um, built around a fault line between left and right, between social democracy and conservatism. That has largely disappeared. Um, the real fault lines now are between a political mainstream and a group of, uh, a growing uh, a group of disaffected voters who are disaffected with the mainstream, whether of uh, left or, or of right, um, uh, and who are disaffected because they feel they no, have, no longer have a voice in, 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 in politics. Um, and they do so, do so for a number of reasons. They've, economic forces has marginalised many sections of uh, uh, working, many working class communities in Europe. Um, the imposition of austerity policies, a whole series of economic and political changes has marginalised their position. And at the, same, at the same time, social democratic parties have cut their links with their old working class constituencies. Um, the shift from Labour to New Labour being a, a, a classic example. And so there are, there, there's a whole... Um, section of the population who feel disaffected, disengaged from the political mainstream, who feel that the mainstream political parties are not voicing their concerns, their anxieties and so on. Now immigration has played no role in that transformation or in creating that uh, sense of disaffection, but immigration has become, if you like, the, the symbol of those unacceptable change. Um, so um, because, you know, globalisation, the forces of globalisation or the, or the internal wranglings of the Labour Party are difficult to see. Um, you know, the Muslim who lives next door or the Polish builder are easy to see. And, and because over the past half century, 
immigration has always been as seen as a problem that must be solved. So immigration has become the, the, this, the means through which people understand their marginalisation, um, their, their, um, their, their voicelessness, if you like. And that is, I think, a, a, a large reason for the, for the rise of um, anti-immigrant hostility, hostility towards Muslims. They are not like us. It's become a, an us and them thing. And so um, I think we need, to, well, we need to challenge both the anti-immigrant hostility, but also the reasons for the disaffection of um, uh, large sections of voters, um, reasons that are, that are um, important for us to address, um, questions about um, decline in jobs, about austerity, uh, all those kinds of issues. I think both needs to go, we need both those issues, we need to take it hand in hand. Isn't there the reason why immigrants are targeted also because of an underlying racism though? I think it's because there's a, over the past half century, right from the beginning, immigrants have been seen as a problem, a problem to be dealt with. And so inevitably that's the framework in which all society looks upon immigrants. Um, not as a resource, not as something, not as a group of people who've actually made our societies better, but as a problem that must be dealt with. Um, and in the context of um, a, a, in a, a political landscape where people are disaffected from the mainstream, the, the immigration has become symbolic of the failures of the liberal elite to... to, to, to um, to listen to what people want. When does it become bigotry, though, then? Is there no bigotry when there's a discussion around immigration issues? Oh, yeah, there's, there's lots of bigotry, there's lots of racism. All I'm suggesting is that um, we shouldn't dismiss um, uh, all, all those who may follow UKIP, who may support UKIP on the front, or even the Front National or, or, or Pegida, as just being racist. Clearly, um, somebody like Donald Trump is bigoted, he's racist. Um, but that doesn't mean that all those who, who, who might vote for him, who might support him, are also bigoted and racist in that fashion. Um, there the, are the reasons, I think, we should understand as to why they've become so disaffected and disengaged from the mainstream. And also why mainstream policies have encouraged that. It, it, it's one of the ironies of, 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 of the political scene today that mainstream politicians, on the one hand, attack groups like the Front National or UKIP or Pegida as being racist. And at the same time, they adopt anti-immigration policies. They, 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 they promote that sense of um, antagonism against migration. And what happens? Well, first, it just increases cynicism about mainstream poli uh, politicians, but it also legitimises the arguments um, of, 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 of the far right when it comes to migration um, uh, Muslims and so on. As a final question, you know, what's the solution? I mean, I, do you think we can safeguard borders anymore? It just seems impossible. And if not, then what's the alternative? Well, there, is, there, there are two different issues here. The one is the question of open borders. The other is the question of, um, does open, do open borders um, provide a, a threat to uh, the nation. Now, as an ideal, open borders are fine. I think in, in, in practice it depends on circumstances and on, on context. But what I would say is that the argument against open borders, um, the, the idea that they are a, a threat and a problem, um, are usually wrong. Um, there are two main arguments um, that are made about open borders. The first is that um, if you have an open border, the whole world will walk in. The second is the idea that it means that there are no border controls. I think both are wrong. Um, we forget that open borders were the norm until recently, and that there are lots of cases um, of open borders, both then and now. Um, Britain had an open border to the Commonwealth until um, the early 60s. America had an open border to Mexico until the 60s. Spain had an open border to North Africa until the 1990s. The whole world didn't walk in. What happened with it? Uh, small numbers came to do work, usually seasonal work, and went back. 
um, uh, when work was no longer available. It was it was a it was a workable, uh, perfectly uh, 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 useful system. The irony is that it's the imposition of controls that created the problems that those controls were were meant to solve. So. Um, when Britain announced that it was going to introduce migration control, so it's, it's a 62 Immigration Act, um, lots more people came from the Caribbean and South Asia to beat the closing door, brought their family and settled with them. In, in the 50s, we forget, initially, migration was sort of um, young men who came to do work and who, who had every intention of going back when they'd done some work. But what happened was, was because of those controls, we had a lot, much larger numbers came in and settled. Same thing in America, where Mexican migrants used to come uh, from Mexico to America, um, California, places like that, to do seasonal work and go back. Once they started closing the borders, the many more came in, settled in, the, in, in, in America, and thousands more then tried to smuggle themselves into America uh, um, uh, um, as undocumented illegal workers. Same in Spain. Um, I, I mentioned the fact that um, Spain used to have an open border to, to, to North Africa. Workers used to come in and out, no problem. But once the border was imposed, then large numbers tried to smuggle themselves in and have been trying to smuggle themselves in ever since. So it's often the case that it's not open borders, but the imposition of controls, ironically, that creates a problem that is meant to solve in the first place. As for border control, um, open borders doesn't mean you don't, can't have controls of borders. It just means you don't have um, arbitrary criteria about who, to, who you should let in or not. It doesn't mean that you can't uh, control borders. Um, it just means that you've taken a decision that you're not going to have arbitrary um, categories of people who are going to let in or, or, or not let in or, or exclude. One final, final question, and that's on uh, profiling uh, of Muslims. What do you think about that? People who argue for profiling um, usually argue that what they want to do is use statistical data to catch criminals. Now, if that was all that profiling was, then most people wouldn't have any problems with it. But in real life, profiling means something very different. It's using certain demographic categories, which are politically and socially salient, to target certain groups. So, for instance, the NYPD, until it, last year, until it was closed down by the courts, had a special surveillance unit to spy on Muslim communities. Um, mass spying program on mosques, on cafes, on restaurants, uh, on street corners, and so on. Entirely illegal. Um, that was why it was shut down, but also entirely useless in gaining any information about security. What it did do was to create that sense of us and them, and that Muslims were the enemy, and that's, that's part of the problem. It's true that um, if you exclude non-Muslim terrorism, that all terrorism is created by Muslims, um, if you want to stack the decks in that way. Um, and it's true that if you only look at Muslim terrorism, that 100% non-Muslims aren't involved. Therefore, um, someone might say that it makes sense, therefore, to profile Muslims, to check simply Muslims. But 99.9% .9 of Muslims aren't involved in terrorism either. Therefore, it make, if it makes no sense to profile non-Muslims, it makes equally no sense to profile Muslims. Um, Bruce Schneier, the, 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 um, the security expert, uh, it was a debate with Sam Harris, in fact, about, um, uh, about profiling. He makes the point that um, if you profile every Muslim who used airports since 9-11, the chances of you finding a terrorist among them were 1 in 80 million. So it's, it's, it's an entirely useless... Uh, uh, policy from a security point of view, from a social and political point of view, what it does is sets up divisions, creates an us and them attitude, and sets up all Muslims as 
a, a potential terrorist and therefore it's a potential target. It's, a, it's politically wrong and in terms of security it's useless. What is a security alternative? Well, the, f the first point to, to realise is that um, there are very few terrorists. That um, mass trawling of communities and mass trawling of, of travellers um, is not going to help you to catch the handful of terrorists. Bruce Nyam, again, he, he, he makes a point very well. He says, um, what we should do is not be terrorised by the terrorists. Uh, if we start profiling, what we're doing is actually giving in to terrorists because what the terrorists want is to be able to terrorise us. That's what we should say. We, we, we're not going to be terrorised by the terrorists. We're not going to engage in policies that are destructive, divisive uh, and have no value at all. Thank you very much. Pleasure. I hope you enjoyed that brilliant interview with Kinan Malik. For me, I think the crux of the issue is that we are faced with this huge crisis, a large part of it because of EU policies itself. Uh, but, you know, given this crisis that we're faced with, defending people, protecting people, treating people humanely who have been forced to flee is a moral imperative. It is immoral not to help them. And just to give you a couple of statistics, you've got half of the entire population of Syria on the move, half a million women who are pregnant. And I recently read an interview with someone who was saying that there are no more children in Syria. They are just little adults and everyone is just waiting to die. Uh, apart from the tragedy that when you actually look at it, every time you actually read and, and, and think about it, it's just heartbreaking. Apart from this issue, this situation reminds me of the uh, time of the medieval times, really that people were tied to the land. And anybody who moved away from the little area, they were criminalized, they would be arrested and returned back to where they came from. This is happening exactly the same, in the same format, apart from little area. Now is the country you tie to that no matter what it is, no matter it's war, oppression, you are expected to stay and suffer that. And I think that's in the same way that that policy of tying people to the land moved it was you know history moved above that and freedom of movement became an important uh, demand uh, and the standard of uh, human progress is the same thing today mm -hmm. and i think by referring to and demanding unconditional of, uh, uh, right of people to move freely no borders no if no buts no borders that's what we need to stand for and that's the key anything less these days I think is just reactionary and is not going to work. The Indonesian Ulama Council have announced that they are writing a fatwa. They haven't written it yet, but they've had to announce that they're writing it just in case you thought that they were sitting on their asses all day, not doing anything. And I think they, 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 they keep busy and sort of... They're uh, busy. The, everybody's got to wait for the earth-shattering <laughs> fatwa. Yes, I mean, we are just, you know, when, when we heard that they're writing it, we couldn't eat, we couldn't sleep. It was just awful. And, you know, well, the good news is, according to them, is they've already done a fatwa against LGBTQ people, you know, calling them religiously deviant and so on and so forth. But now they're writing a fatwa against those who advocate for LGBTQ rights. Anything to do with people's liberation and freedom and sexuality, it bothers them. But what's the important, what's the important thing about this? There's nothing, nothing important about it. That's the whole point. Your fatwas are ridiculous. They're absurd. They're not useful. I think they need to zip it and get on. Zip and get it, a Trumpy. <laughs> they should just get a decent <laughs> job and do something decent. Get a life. decent job. And I think this is also this is a good advice. Be for, productive. This is a good advice for the Iranian mullahs as well. Yeah, for all just of them. Get on with your life and do something decent like everybody else. Leave people alone, please. We're fed up with you. Mm -hmm.
This week's slice of life is from the brilliant Egyptian topless activist Alia Magda El Mahdi. She went to an event in Sweden which was promoting the veil uh, and she held up a sign saying the veil is sexism, it's not anti-racism. Common sense of course, but one that many will be surprised at. Hmm, I thought the veil was the greatest symbol of women's liberation. <laughs> And I think this is this, this is what we were saying earlier that resistance to oppression is important, and that I think this picture and action by um, Alia captures that. Yeah, definitely. And of course, you know, w when you look at the issue of the hijab in a Western co uh, context, it's very often you know women who are privileged who don't have it forced on them uh, will defend the right to wear the hijab, whereas in fact the real question and issue is that for a vast majority of people it's not a choice, it's imposed, it's enforced, and actions such as Alia Magda El Mahdi's are hugely important in raising that fact of life for a large number of people. Well done, Alia. Yeah, we loved it. Thank you. So anyway, we've reached the end of our program. We hope you enjoyed this week's program. The discussions and interview. Do keep sending us your comments. Thank you for all your comments on YouTube and Facebook and Twitter and so on and so forth. We really appreciate it. Thank you also for all your support via Patreon and our PayPal account. So do keep supporting us in any way that you can. That brings us to the end of the program. Yeah. And goodbye. Until next week, bye.